Good evening and welcome. I'm Harold Holzer, director of the Roosevelt House, and uh, on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, it's a pleasure to have you back for this special talk from a very special individual, Tom Wheeler. And in welcoming my friend Tom here and welcoming all of you back to Roosevelt House, I'm struck about how perfect a setting this is to welcome a communications innovator. Because on the morning after the 1932 election, Franklin D. Roosevelt rolled himself down the hallway uh, from the library, Tom, where we were just sitting, um, and sat down in the parlor upstairs uh, and uh, basically delivered two takes of a speech to the people, assuring them that he was on the job and though there were four months to go before the inauguration, all would be well. A bold uh, promise because he didn't know that all would be well. He did it once for radio, and then they put a flower pot in front of the, of the microphone. He did it again for the newsreel cameras with his uh, son and daughter and his mother flanking him. Eleanor was downstairs greeting guests from the neighborhood, most of whom did not support FDR for president. <laughs> she was doing an open house. I've learned all this because I'm writing about it right now. Anyway, it was, since he did it in front of his fireplace, it was the first fireside chat. Um, it doesn't count as such because it wasn't done in the White House, but we don't care. We call it the first fireside chat. So such innovations are something our special guest knows a great deal about because, among other accomplishments, he was chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, um, an agency that, I just want to say, two years after the inaugural, the inauguration of FDR, uh, President Roosevelt created as part of the New Deal. Um, it would be a new deal on communications as well. Um, I have to tell you on a personal note that I met Tom Wheeler 13 years ago, um, back in 2006 when he wrote a book about modern presidential communications focused on another president in whom, as you all know, I'm also interested, and Tom is as well, Abraham Lincoln. The book was called Mr. Lincoln's T-Mails. Tom Wheeler is great at titles. From Gut Gutenberg to Google is not bad either. I wish he would do my titles. Um, and it, about the president, about President Lincoln's uncanny gift for deploying uh, telegraph communications. And he presented the book just at the moment the email revolution was beginning. So T mails, emails. Today it would be called Mr. Lincoln's tweet storms, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> But I think that's the, that's, the, that's the point, that this is a revolution in progress uh, with borders we can't even imagine. And Tom Wheeler is here to navigate it for us a bit uh, tonight. I have to tell you one other personal story. Tom may not remember this, but um, a year after we met in uh, 2007, we had dinner in Washington where we inevitably started talking, you do remember, about presidential politics. Uh, 21st century style. And he told me he was putting his business career on hold uh, in the cable and wireless industry to move to Iowa for months to support the beginning candidacy of the senator from Illinois. And I, with such a brilliant instinct for, for politics, said, Obama, are you kidding? Well, we see who was right about that. Um, it began in Iowa. Tom left there only when he was assured that he had changed history. Um, so Tom Wheeler, um, a native of Redlands, California, uh, home of a Lincoln Shrine, right? He was president of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, uh, spent years creating and running amazing startups in the communications field. He is a member of the Wireless Hall of Fame. Um, since we can't have Marconi, we have Tom Wheeler. Um, it sounds like he's ungrounded, but that's not what it means. He's also in the Cable Television Hall of Fame. And he's a dear friend of my dear friend, Brian Lamb of C-SPAN, who will be here May 3rd, just a little bit of promotion for Roosevelt House to present his new book. Um, Tom has never shied away from taking tough positions on challenging issues. He was right in the middle of the net neutrality debate as FCC chairman. 
And in his new book, oh, did I mention that President Obama named him ultimately? I'm sure it had nothing to do with his his residence in Iowa, but he named him as obviously the most qualified guy to be the head of the FCC. And in his new book, he reminds us that this kind of change has been happening for centuries, for eons, and will be happening in the future. And if history indeed teaches us to learn from and avoid the mistakes of the past, I can't think of anyone better qualified to navigate these the uncertainties and the opportunities. Before we begin, one nod to the challenges of the high-tech world. Please, I beg you, silence any devices you have that may make a noise because we are telecasting and recording for YouTube this evening. Um, and when the Q&A begins, I know you all have much more resounding and wonderful voices than I do. The reason we ask you to wait for the microphone is so we can record your questions again for our YouTube audience. Tonight we will hear from our special guest. You will have an opportunity to ask questions. And then we will, as always, head upstairs to the Four Freedoms Room um, for a reception and a good old-fashioned communications event, uh, an homage to the printed word, a book signing. And we hope you'll all join us for that. Right now, please join us in welcoming our special guest, Tom Wheeler. Wow, what a nice introduction. Thank you, Harold. Um, the story he tells about the dinner is true, and I would just like to make one observation. If I had listened to Harold's counsel, I would not have become chairman of the FCC. <laughs> uh, but it is wonderful to be here. I, I met Harold when I was working on the Lincoln book because the truth the truism about Lincoln is that all things Lincoln go through Harold Holzer. Uh, I called him the dean of Lincoln scholars. Um, and I think at one point in time we were doing an event together and I actually referred to you as Dean Holzer. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but Harold was absolutely wonderful in, um, in taking this guy who had uh, uh, no Lincoln background that he knew of uh, and embracing him and the idea of studying Abraham Lincoln through his telegrams uh, because the thesis of the book is that we, we won't we'll talk about this book but the thesis of that book is that Abraham Lincoln was the first online president um, and um, so uh, so I was particularly honored when uh, Harold suggested I come and be with you all uh, tonight I also am thrilled to see some friends here, Alberto Abaryuan, who, who I was privileged to, to uh, carry Alberto's bag when he was the president of PBS, uh, and the chair, chairman of the board of PBS, and I was on the board of PBS. Uh, if you want a thankless job, folks, you can volunteer to be chairman of PBS. <laughs> Um, but the job that Alberto did and the wonderful things that he's doing now uh, at the Knight Foundation really making differences at a time when we're going to be talking about some of the things that Alberto was out fighting for and making sure it worked. The other is Mike Geekin, my old friend Mike Geekin sitting back there, who is also uh, an author. Um, uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Going Public. And Mike is with the Industrial Areas Foundation. Um, a Saul Alinsky uh, inspired group that organizes for uh, social justice uh, around the country. And um, my wife uh, and Mike uh, were active, uh, my, my wife was a, an acolyte of Mike's in, in the Washington program. I was the tag along, but I was the winner because I got to know Mike Geekin and the job that he has done and his, the title of his book, Going Public, is you know, a play on the words of everybody getting rich, but in this case, you get rich by, but society gets rich by taking issues to the public and getting them involved. And that's what Mike has done. Mike is a master, one of the best grassroots organizers you'll ever find in this country, and I'm really honored that you came tonight, Mike. Um, so, and now I will come to the technological terrifying moment. <laughs> <laughs> work. 
So it's got to work, huh? Look at that. Okay. So, so this is a tweet that went viral um, recently um, that says, think back to as recently as 2003 and the things that we take for granted today that didn't exist then. And you know, you can go through the whole list, but let's just look at a couple here. The world's largest taxi company owns no cars. The world's largest hotelier owns no beds. 4G, fourth generation wireless service, is already has been. Everybody's talking about, oh, it's going to be 5G, and we've got to make sure that, that we get 5G out because of all the wonderful things that it can do. These are examples of how technology has come at us rapidly to change the way we live our lives. It's also changed the way our economy works. Odds are that in a newspaper today, you were reading a financial report. Alberto knows more about this than I do. You're reading a financial report or a sports score that was written by artificial intelligence. Um, my favorite on this point is that last week, Warner Music signed a 20 album contract with an algorithm. 20 albums to be produced by this algorithm. There we go. Try this one on for size. 52% of the Fortune 500 companies at the turn of the century, the year 2000, no longer exist. 52% no longer exist because of the kind of change that is driving our economy. And of course, we've got the reality that we are at a 100-year high in wealth disparity. If you look at the chart of the distribution of wealth to the top one-tenth of one percent, it has a high over here in the roaring 20s, goes down like this until about 1970, 1980 starts to go back up, and it is now up here at the same level of the disparity that existed in the 1920s. And that's the response. <laughs> oh my goodness. There is anxiety and a search for stability that all of those changes and others, changes to our economy, changes to the way we live our lives produces. And what I try and do in From Gutenberg to Google is to put our changes in perspective. So for instance, consider the original information revolution, Gutenberg's printing press. It freed information from being locked away so that it could only be used by the priestly and the powerful. Created the first, the original, information revolution. Helped to destroy the feudal economy that had existed for a millennium. And the Catholic Church got all upset about the fake news that it was delivering. 400 years later, 
the first high-speed network, the railroad, came into play. It was the death of distance. Think about it. For as long as mankind had existed, geography had controlled the human experience. Your personal life, your economic opportunity, all circumscribed by how far you could travel on your muscle power or the muscle power of animals. And all of a sudden, the steam locomotive comes along and rips down those barriers that had been created by geography and, and by distance, traveling at the breakneck speed of 20 miles an hour. You know, in some of the early trains, the passengers took along pads of paper and pencils to see if they could write, if their brains would be able to work when their body was going so fast as 20 miles an hour. That delivered the Industrial Revolution. It destroyed the agrarian economy of subsistence farming. It destroyed local economies of artisans in favor of factories. And it was followed immediately by the first electronic network, the telegraph, so that there was a bam, bam that, were hitting, that was hitting the citizens who lived through the middle of the 19th century with these two transformational technologies. The Telegraph introduced speed into communications and introduced the reality that we all live with today when we can't bring ourselves from not looking at our iPhones, which is the ability to know a piece of information in real time makes it essential that you know it. And that was the gift that the telegraph gave us. It also gave us fake news. There was a serious worry at the time that, um, that once a piece of information got on the wire, it was accepted as gospel. And how do we know what's true and what's not true? So the kinds of experiences that we are having today are echoes of what we have seen before. And I describe this, the subtitle of the book is From Gutenberg to Google, The History of Our Future, because that's what we're talking about here. This is the history of where we're going and it's driven by two factors. One is the Darwinian evolution of technology. You know, we like to think that, that uh, it's two guys and a dog in a garage that had this eureka moment and all of a sudden, no. There's an evolutionary process that we'll talk about in a second. And the second component of the history of our future is that the technologies that are thus introduced by that evolutionary process are always disruptive. Disruptive of individual lives, disruptive of economic activity, and therefore informative of us. Let's talk about the evolution for a second. If you look at the digital code that 
traverses the internet today. It is based on the same concept that was the genius behind Gutenberg. Gutenberg's, the genius of Gutenberg's printing press was not this, was not pressing uh, uh, plates down uh, on a sheet of paper. That had been going on for centuries where, uh, where people had carved a full page into a woodblock and used that to make impressions on paper. The genius of what Gutenberg did was he saw that collection of information not as a collective, but as its smallest parts. And, and then how do we take those smallest parts, disassemble them for reuse again? And that is what digital code is. How do we take and break a problem or a page or whatever into a collection of pieces of digital code, send it out over the network, over a distributed network, so it can be reassembled again. So if you peel back the onion of digital code, eventually you come to Gutenberg's breakthrough observation. Similarly, if you peel back the history of computer chips, you end up with steam power and the locomotive. Quick story. The first public operational um, um, railroad service, passenger service, was the Stockton and Darlington Railroad in northeastern England. And at the first running of that first railroad was a British mathematician by the name of Charles Babbage. And um, sidebar for a second, somebody was killed by the locomotive on that first run and Babbage invented the cowcatcher. But Babbage's real claim to fame was that, he, as I said, he was a mathematician. He was a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And as a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, his job was to sit and calculate astronomical tables that could be used by ships and others to, to, to understand what was happening in the heavens. And, and, and doing an astronomical table is like doing your multiplication tables. You know, it's a redundant kind of a process that just goes like this. And, and you can imagine large numbers, redundant process, easy to make mistakes. So the way in which it worked was that two mathematicians would sit across from each other. They would each sit there and they would go through this laborious, long process. And then they would compare the answers to see if they could find where they didn't agree and one of them had made a mistake. And finally, one day, in the midst of all of this laborious, repetitive calculation, Babbage turns to his colleague and says, I wish to God these calculations had been done by steam because steam was powering everything else. And why couldn't it power some kind of a mathematical machine? It had been substituted for, substituting for muscle power, why couldn't it substitute for this muscle? And he dedicated the rest of his life to designing that machine using Victorian era technologies of spokes and sprockets and gears. And he designed the computer. 
he had all the components. He had input, he had output, uh, he had processing, he had storage, all of these things that nobody had ever conceptualized before. And he designed it on hundreds of pages of detailed blueprints. Only a small model was ever built. The full thing would have been the size of a locomotive. Um, and he died, and it was forgotten. And we all think of Turing and names like this as the great fathers of computing. They never heard of Charles Babbage. He was rediscovered a couple of decades ago. And the London Science Museum decided that they were going to build his machine. And they used technology that was available in the middle of the 19th century. And they built the machine. And they powered it up. And it worked. So we can trace our computing capability back to steam and the vision of a man by the name of Charles Babbage. So that's one half of the history of our future. And from Gutenberg to Google tells those kinds of stories. But now let's talk about the impact of that. First, the Reformation, and then the Renaissance, as what flowed from the, um, from the printing press. As I said, um, Gutenberg picked the lock that had kept information secluded and allowed it to be inexpensively distributed. When Gutenberg tacked his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg, they weren't original thoughts. Ideas like this had been cooking around Europe for some time amongst various clergymen. But they could only go as far as that individual's voice. Gutenberg put his theses forward at a time when there was also the ability to extend his voice. And um, so, you think we got upheaval as a result of our technology now? How about the decades of wars that were the result of the Reformation? The Renaissance would have remained in, isolated in northern Italy for a longer period of time had not the printing press enabled its dissemination. And again, we look back, we go, oh, the Renaissance, such a beautiful time. All the amazing things that were happening and being created. It must have been hell. Because everything that anybody had been taught to believe was suddenly torn asunder. And the scientific method enabled by the printing press took over and began to propound new ideas and create incredible amounts of instability. Look at the effects of the steam locomotive. I said before that it destroyed not only subsistence agriculture, but also the artisan society by the artisan economy by, um, by um, eliminating local businesses. You know, if you wanted to plow, you took it to the local, you went to the local blacksmith. And two blacksmiths doing 11 tasks would produce a plow for you in 118 hours. On the factory floor, 52 men 
doing 97 different tasks, you produce the same product in 3.75 hours and then send it back out to an interconnected market at a price significantly below that which the blacksmiths could do. So this is the history of our future. This is how we got to this point. And every generation, every individual lives at their own terminus of history. You know, that's where we sit tonight, at our terminus of history. And for us, and the changes that we're living through, that history is, is defined by two pathways. One is ubiquitous connectivity, and the other is low cost and thus ubiquitous computing. And as I said, you can watch through history as that Darwinian process evolves. You start in connectivity and you start with printing, you go to the telegraph, you go to the telephone, you go to wireless connectivity. You go over into computing and we've got our friend Charles Babbage, the mainframe computer, Moore's Law, which you know said that every couple of years the computing power of a microchip will double and the, the cost will half, which is why we have chips in everything today and have ubiquitous chips. We have been living, we, in this room, have been living while these developed right around us, particularly the last several steps, last couple of steps, for the last several decades. And then all of a sudden, these two paths had sex. <laughs> I, um, that line is in the book. <laughs> I got a call from a friend who was reading the book. He says, how in the world did they, your editor let you keep that in the book? The fact of the matter is that what we're living in right now is a time that is being defined by the union of these two pathways. And the effect of that combination is that everything computes, and everything connects. And as a result of that, a new capital asset has been created, digital information. This is a chart that was developed by the consultancy IDC on the growth, the future growth of data being created today. You can see you are there, okay? There's a bit of a ride still ahead of us. 90% of all the world's data was created in the last two years. But let me put this in perspective for you. There are 39 million volumes in the Library of Congress. 39 million. Every day, the connected computers generate 3 million libraries of Congress. Every day. And this has created what I call in the book the asset, the new asset, the new capital asset of the 21st century, digital information. I don't know if you remember this cover from The Economist a couple of years ago, in which they said the data is the new oil, and those companies you see there are the new members of OPEC. They were wrong. The analogy doesn't hold. Data is different from every other 
asset in the history of the world, and that is that it's inexhaustible. There is a finite amount of oil in the ground. There is a finite amount of demand for that oil. There is a finite amount of gold. There is a finite demand for the amount of gold. For the first time in history, we have an infinite asset. We have computer chips connected to other computer chips that, by their interaction, create new data, that creates new products, that creates new data. And we are living with the first perpetual motion machine. The inexhaustible creation of the essential asset of the 21st century. And one of our challenges is how do we deal with that? How do we bring an industrial era mindset to this reality of a completely different basis for economic activity. Here's another thing that'll blow you away. Remember this cartoon? It's like about 1993, I think it was, you know, on the internet. These were the halcyon days of the internet, right? Oh, you know, everybody, nobody knows you're on the internet. Today, almost half of that data that we looked at on the chart a moment ago is personal data about you and me. 47% to be specific. The rest is machines that are creating you know, jet engines throwing off all kinds of data, uh, um, M MRI machines throwing off all kinds of data, et cetera. Half the data is our personal information. And so this cartoon has changed. Now, the cartoon represents today as a couple of spooks. But the fact of the matter is that capitalism has produced what Big Brother could only have dreamed of. The, total, the fear of the totalitarian state has been eclipsed by the realities of a capitalist economy taking advantage of the fact that everything produces data. So, this is the history of our future, right here. That, um, our moment in history, defined by ubiquitous connectivity and low-cost computing. And so you ask yourself the question, what's next? Well, one thing that we're going to have to come to grips with is the fact that our concept of networks is that the concept that we have of networks is no longer valid. A network has always been something that transported something from point A to point B. Today, when we're thinking about meshes of computer chips talking to the next computer chip on down the line and routing um, information. We have networks that are moving from transportation to orchestration, to orchestrating the vast flood of information that they, in part, are creating. Let me give you an example. The connected car 
right? We all, we all look and we get Waze or Google Maps or something like this delivered to our car so we don't get lost anymore. That's a classic network point-to-point -point activity. The autonomous car is thousands of data points out here collecting information that are orchestrated in the network and affect the activities of the car so you don't run into the beer truck next to you. It's been estimated that a, an autonomous vehicle will in one day produce 3,000 times more data than one of us produces in a day now. So we're going to see networks doing entirely different things. We're not going to carry around big clunky things like this anymore because this has to be clunky because there's computing power in here. The computing power is going to be in the network. So we'll be able to have it right here on our glasses or some other place and it'll only be a display function. Artificial intelligence. Everybody talks about artificial intelligence and oh my goodness the things that are going to happen there. I was at a meeting with the with the communications minister of Argentina at one point in time and all he could talk about was the study out of Oxford that 47 percent of the now existent jobs would be destroyed as a result of artificial intelligence. Only if we sit on our hands. You know, I refuse to believe that it's the end of the world because we're still in control. Everybody, who, who's, who remembers 2001, the movie, Space Odyssey, 2001, right? Hal decided, remember the computer, Hal decided he was going to take over. And Dave, the astronaut, what'd he do? He unplugged him. <laughs> yes, AI is going to be a great challenge. But our job is to respond to that, not to sit on our hands. The third big change is blockchain. Um, and it's, this is far beyond Bitcoin and these kinds of things. It's the redefinition of trust. Forty years after Gutenberg, a guy by the name of Luca Pacoletti, who was a Venetian mathematician, published a book in which he described what you and I now would call double entry bookkeeping. And it began to be adopted throughout Italy and then throughout Europe and it enabled banking because what it said was everybody's keeping score the same way. And so my bank here will trust this bank here is keeping score the same way and will transfer funds, draw against, whatever the case may be. And the banking business was selling that trust. Just like the credit card business today is selling the trust that your card will be accepted and that the merchant will get paid for it through a centralized structure. When you have a distributed network, this intelligent network, and you can distribute what used to be a centralized ledger out here across the network, you change the definition of trust. And you move it away from only a handful of people in a centralized point to a distributed. And then the last big change that will drive us is the scourge of cybersecurity. We all hear about this. We all pick up the newspaper and see it all the time. Why should we be surprised? Throughout history, networks have been attack vectors. 
You know, I don't care whether it was the Native Americans following an animal path to attack the next village or Caesar marching down roads to conquer the world, networks have always been attack vectors. And so why should we be surprised that the most important network of the 21st century ends up being an attack vector? Our challenge is, will we get in front of that? But one of the things that I talk about in From Gutenberg to Google is that it is never the primary network that is transformational, but always the secondary effects that are enabled or that result from that network that causes the transformation in society and economies. So let's look at a couple of those that we're living with right now. One is what I call digital alchemy. There is an amazing practice going on where your property, your information about your personal lives is collected and becomes a corporate asset. It's what I call digital alchemy, changing your personal information to a corporate asset. And it is the heart of the internet economy. And it has produced market control and market dominance that we haven't seen since the days of Rockefeller, Carnegie, and others in the Gilded Age. The collection of your and my information is hoarded just like in medieval times, they hoarded the printed word, I'm sorry, the written word, because it was, it was written out in hand by monks, hoarded that information to manipulate individuals. Now that information is hoarded in order to manipulate markets. One of the great things that Alberto is working on is how do we make sure that vibrant local journalism stays alive? Facebook and Google control 48% of all local digital advertising. They, their monopoly position with the data means that only they have the information about the neighbors of the local media. And they don't share it. And the secondary effects of this, for instance, are that Google ends up controlling 60% of search 85% of the Android operating systems, 85% of the mobile operating systems in the world are Google's Android system. And that and YouTube and Waze and everything else they do, all that information that gets collected allows them to be the company that serves 57% of all digital advertising in the country because they hoard this information and say, only I am going to have access to it. How do we take your, your property, your information, make it a corporate asset, hoard it, so that we can get monopoly rents for it? That same alchemy also creates a new era of tribalism an era of not only the kind of economic inequality that we were talking about before, but also of information segregation. It used to be 
that the media was a unifying force, right? Now what happens is that digital alchemy takes your personal data and uses it to target you with information that, you're, that, that, that you have indicated through your activities you are responsive to. And in the process, technology encourages the inherent human instinct to tribalism by saying, I'm going to only serve you what you want to hear. I'm only going to serve you what you want to hear. The business plan says, hey, we want to keep people on this site for as long as we can so we can show them as many ads as we can. And therefore, we'll give them what they want. <coughs> and you micro-target down and encourage the tribalism, which ultimately has a negative effect on a coming together that is necessary for democracy to succeed. And then again, the disparity of wealth and the disparity of opportunity that is created in this kind of a digital world. The reality today in terms of opportunity, there are two types of jobs. Tech jobs that pay real well and everything else. So, we've been going through and living through the, our history. What have we learned from that? Well, the first thing we learned is the good old days are fake history. <laughs> okay? Everybody says, oh, wow, it was a good old day. You know, we, we say, make America great again. What made America great was the fact that we tackled these problems, not that we retreated from them. And the kind of challenges that we are seeing now, let's go back to what we were talking about a minute ago. You want to compare it to the Reformation? You want to compare it to decades of war? You want to compare it to the upheaval of the, of the, um, of the Industrial Revolution? Yes, we've got challenges. Yes, we're being confronted by change. But the halcyon days of the past are informative, but they're not a place to retreat to. And the reason they're informative is they tell us what worked was that, they, was that those challenges were confronted. But we have a new challenge added to our growing list, and that is that we've lost the buffer of time. You know, it used to be that, okay, well, we can gradually get used to this change. It took 125 years for the telephone to reach a billion people. It took the Android mobile phone less than six years. And that's the kind of change, that's the rapidity with which change is hitting us now. And that we have to learn to deal with. And again, we've got to say, what are the new responses to the new challenges? The other thing that we learn from history is that the pioneers make the rules. Okay, I don't care whether you are the, you are a homesteader or you are Carnegie. You made the rules, or you're Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, you made the rules because only you understood what was going on, and you got to set those ground rules to serve your purpose until your rules began to infringe on the rights of others and the public interest. And that's the point that we are at today.
And if we look back, one of the lessons of history is that new technology demands new rules. You know, when we left agrarian mercantilism in the middle of the 19th century for a world of industrial capitalism, the rules for agrarian mercantilism didn't work anymore. And we had to do something about that. And it wasn't easy, it was a struggle. I think Harold would agree with me that we probably fought a civil war over issues relating to the impact of technology on two separate sections of the nation. But in the end, we came up with, gu with guardrails for industrial capitalism. Antitrust, consumer protection, um, worker protection, that allowed the benefits of capitalism to succeed while at the same time putting guardrails in to protect against the inherent excesses that result from the incentive provided by capitalism. And I would suggest that we're at that same kind of point today. And we ask ourselves the question, do the rules for industrial capitalism continue to work in an era of internet capitalism? We face changes at every level. That chart up there, I don't know, it's kind of an art chart, I chart. I don't know if you can read it. But that is, over time, by birth year, the percentage of individuals who are able to earn more than their parents. That's a challenge we face today. I talked a minute ago about tribalism, e pluribus unum. What happened to e pluribus unum? Democracy works when tribalism is subsumed to the belief that working together will benefit all. That's what e pluribus unum says. That chart in the upper left hand doesn't show benefiting all. So we have an environment in which technology says, let me deliver messages tribally, and economics say, I'm not gonna retreat out of my tribe because I don't see the greater good that is possible. And so we're back to the point that we started off with, that technology-driven anxieties cause a great search for stability. And that everybody wants answers, and they want them now. There is a reason why authoritarianism is on the rise around the world. Liberal democracy had been on the rise. Now, authoritarianism is the growth structure, if you will, because they got answers. We got problems, they got answers the right answers, but they got answers. People are looking for answers. Slogans take over for policy. What a tragedy that we're watching in England and the UK right now is the slogan of Brexit. What a tragedy we might be on the verge of in this country 
as the slogan of a wall might shut down our, large, our relations with our largest trading partner and immediately have an impact on prices. Slogans become something people rally around rather than solutions at a time when you've got that kind of angst in society. And we vote for symbols because we're looking for answers. So the challenge that we all face, it seems to me, how do you make, how do you take from Gutenberg to Google and relate it to today? How do we make the democratic process work in circumstances that were wildly inconceivable to our founders? And I think that boils down to a recognition that if we're going to make democracy work, that we have to recognize that democracy was designed to be deliberate. It is a slow process by definition because that is how you involve everybody. Again, the autocrat can say, that's the answer, but it doesn't involve everybody. And it requires the suspension of the tribal instincts in the belief of collective benefit. And our challenge is how do we preserve democracy? And I believe preserve capitalism in the process at a time when everybody, autocrats, slogans, have simple, quote, solutions. One quick story and then I'll shut up. I was invited to speak at the Singapore summit late last year, which is kind of a Davos light kind of an activity in Singapore, surprisingly. Um, and um, and it's, it was about four or 500 CEOs from Europe and Asia, principally. Regardless of which session I went to, what, regardless of the title in the program or the sign on the door, there were two things that were being discussed. One was the abrogation of American leadership in the world. Paren, and we're going with China. Paren. And second was the fear for the continuation of, lim of liberal democracies as a result of the internet and the kinds of things that we have been talking about here. And so we have a challenge that just like everybody else stood up and faced those challenges, we too have to step up. And the lessons of history is that you don't retreat, you respond. That the innovators make the rules, but at some point in time those rules need guardrails. And we the people and our representatives are the ones who have to insist on those guardrails. It was true for internet capitalism, and it's just as true for, I'm sorry, it's true for industrial capitalism, and it's just as true for internet capitalism. We've got to protect competition, we've got to protect consumers, and we've got to protect workers. And so that's what From Gutenberg to Google is all about. It is about the history of our future. Because if we look at our history, and then look at our today, we can see without dispute, we have been here before, we have faced similar challenges before, we have probably faced tougher challenges before. And the reason that we succeeded was we responded. We are now at our personal terminus of history and our individual opportunity to make history. Thank you very much. Okay, we got questions? Sir, okay, we got a mic, here, here comes the microphone lady, this gentleman in the, 
Roger Hers, uh, could you suggest two new rules? Yeah, uh, and they really aren't new. Roger, thank you for asking that question. Did, you know, so um, so I'm really fortunate right now that I'm um, I'm at uh, Brookings Institution uh, and at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, and I'm working on specifically those kinds of issues. I have come to the conclusion that. Um, that we need um, to actually go back to an old set of rules, a couple of old set of rules, English common law theories. For instance, one um, is the duty to deal. Remember we talked about how they take your information and my information and hoard it? As Western civilization was coming out of the feudal era, common law developed the concept of a duty to deal for instance, the guy who was running the ferry across the river had to take all comers, okay? He didn't have to take them for free, but he, he couldn't pick and choose. The, um, the, um, the uh, tavern keeper had to provide shelter to everyone and board to everyone. The, when the telegraph came along in 1860, the telegraph came along in 1844, when the, in 1860, as the telegraph was expanding, the Pacific Telegraph Act of 1860 contained as section three a duty to deal that said this is an important network that must be non-discriminatory in who gets on. Um, our telephone network was a non-discriminatory network. What we did at the FCC when we passed the open internet rule, the net neutrality rule, was to apply the same kind of concept to the internet. And to say that it had to be non-discriminatory and open. The Trump administration has subsequently repealed that we're hopeful that the court will throw that out. So the first concept is there must be a, oh, and, and how, does that, how does that relate to today? So you have these huge hordes of data, and there is a duty to deal with that data. It is the, it is the hoarding of that data that creates the economic leverage to dominate markets in an anti-competitive way. If that data were made open, just like the ferry was, just like the tavern was, so that you had interconnection into that data accessible by third parties who could provide their services using that data, we would see competition increase, we would see new services increase, and we would see a decrease in the decline of uh, in, the, in the growth of, 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 of corporate control. Uh, I've got a piece coming out later this week um, at, from Brookings uh, uh, called um, um, uh, Don't Break Up, Open Up. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, bless her heart, has this idea of breaking up the big companies. We can talk about that in detail if you want, but I'm saying, hey, let's go for the guts of the issue. The reason that they have this control over the marketplace is that they have this unilateral control over this data as a result of this data alchemy that they've taken from you and me and made it their corporate asset. So that's point one, we need a duty of deal. Second, we need a duty of care. When the railroad in the middle of the 19th century went across farmyards it was spewing cinders. I tell this story in the book. It was spewing cinders that would set barns and hay ricks and houses on fire because there was no duty of care being exercised. The duty of care says, what are the potential consequences that come from my actions and how do I mitigate them? And so the railroads put a screen across the top of the smokestack. And from that 
came the concept of negligence. Out of a duty of care comes the concept of negligence. What have you done? In an environment where you make your own rules, the duty of care kind of falls by the wayside because you get so excited that you've, you know, that you're making something. You know, I used to, I, years ago, I ran a software company and I actually had a little sign on my, uh, on my uh, wall that, that said something to the effect that, um, that sometimes the fact that you can get it to work blinds you to its essential uselessness. And what's going on in a digital world is it's, hey, can we build this? And not think at all about what the consequences are. And how do we build in a duty of care so that, so that that digital alchemy includes how are we going to protect you and me and the use of our information? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, was that your question? <laughs> Sorry, yes. Back here in the in the hoodie. So what can I do? What can we do about regional news? Well, here's the guy to ask. Uh, you know, Alberto, he's saving it. Um, no, it's a it's a it's a terribly important question. Um, we need, we need to be providing, uh, there, we need to have new thinking, number one. Um, uh, there's some interesting things. Alberto has been pioneering some projects uh, for new approaches. An interesting thing that McClatchy and Google just came up with in the last week or so was Google's going to fund three McClatchy operations using, um, using uh, uh, McClatchy reporters and, and, uh, and, and, and facilities. Um, but um, but um, the interesting thing is that, and I'm sure Alberto feels the, the same way, there was a study that came out, I think it was last week, in which the American people said that they didn't see, they were quite satisfied with local news, that they were getting a lot of local news. And it ends up that they were confusing local news with television news. And, and the danger that comes from, and I feel so inadequate standing up in front of Alberto talking about this, but the danger that comes from the death of local newspapers is who's keeping an eye on the city council, okay? So this is stuff that Mike Geekin spent his life working on. Um, and, and what happens is that if you don't have local news, there is still a desire for news, and so people go to national news, and particularly national electronic news. And what do we know about national electronic news? It's fractionalizing. It enhances tribalism. And um, so the answer to your question is, there is no quick answer, but we've got to fight for uh, new approaches. And it's, this is not, let's just go back and, and, and recreate you know, everything that existed before. You know? But we do, we, but we, can't, we cannot accept that which exists now. Alberto, right, and then I'll come back to you, sir, but I'm in. Thanks for, uh, this is a really terrific, I've, I've looked at most of the book and uh, really appreciate uh, your comments today. One of the things you talk about in the book is that the framers gave us a deliberative form of government and you pointed out today that one of the things we've lost is time. Um, you need time to be deliberative. How does Congress, which seems now to be aware if not necessarily informed, but at least aware of the of of some of the issues, and and seems intent on beginning to think about regulation. How do they regulate in a way 
that's relevant and is not immediately obsolete because technology already passed them by. So this is the other half of what I'm working on at Harbors and Brookings um, as, a, as a recovering regulator. Um, we have a representative government. Um, like the people they represent, our, rep our, our elected officials are just beginning to come to speed on technology. You know, I was in sitting with a senior member of the United States Senate who is a name that you would all recognize, who is more attuned to technology than most of his colleagues, and he turns to me and he says, tell me again what an API is. And, um, but this is okay. He's asking the question, and he got the answer, and he's, and he's doing things. I think the bottom line, Alberto, is that we need to um, evolve the way in which, um, in which government operates. Um, and um, so, so our governmental structure today was created in the mold of the Industrial Revolution. First, as a structure to be a countervailing power against, countervailing force against industrial power. But also, looking around and seeing what are the prevailing management techniques? And at that point in time, the prevailing management techniques were you had a guy on the floor who followed a set of rules. And the truck came by and he put this bolt on because that was his job. And the next guy had another set of rules. And they had a supervisor above them who made sure that they were following all the rules. And there was a manager above the supervisors that made sure that they were all following. And we're surprised that we have a rules-based bureaucracy because that's what the structure was. As I said, I used to run a software company years ago. And um, at that point in time, show, I'll show you how long ago it was. Building software was just like building a F 150 Ford truck, step by step by step by step. And then it rolled out the door. It was called the waterfall method because it moved along and then pff, fell off the edge of the waterfall. Today, software is never done. You're constantly getting updates to your iPhones, to your operating system for your computer, to everything else. Because software has to constantly be evolving to reflect the world in which it exists. And, um, and we have not taken that concept into government because our leaders don't yet understand, haven't internalized, that concept. Um, and um, I tried it in three places um, when I was chairman of the FCC. One was the open internet rules, second were the privacy rules, and third was cyber rules. And in each instance, what I did was say this. Here are the broad four corners, called them the bright lines. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So I'm going to establish these, four, the, these bright lines, and then I'm going to put a referee on the field to throw the flag if something doesn't seem to fit inside those bright lines. For open internet, for instance, it was, is it a just and reasonable practice, which is a legally specific term. The companies all said, oh, that's regulatory uncertainty. We don't know what you might do. These were the same companies who would also come in and say, oh, don't give us rules because they're inhibiting. They're so rigid. And they, you know, they stop innovation. So on one hand, it is, it is rules are too rigid, but don't go agile because, you know, and, and when really the bottom line was they wanted no rules. But, um, but, uh, but we need to think of how do we bring the concept of agility into government? And how do we, and, and, and we shouldn't be 
surprised that, uh, that our government is structured as it was. There's no malice aforethought there. It is just, this is the way the world worked. The world doesn't work that way anymore. And we've got to have a new approach. One more question. Sir with the white turtleneck. Thank you, Philip Kibitz. Um, at no time since we have started our electronic age, shall we call it, have I heard anyone talking about the issue of the individual and their physiological and psychological ability to handle the rapidity of the changes, the demands on their time and attention, the intrusion into their life, um, and all I see is that there is more and more suicides, depression, mental illness, as a result of high educated individuals who normally would have a quality of life are now beginning to fall by the wayside. But I see nothing or I hear nothing about attention to where has the halcyon 40 hour uh, work week gone. So uh, I'm, I'm unqualified to speak about you know, physiological aspects of things. It is interesting in history, however, to note that new technology has always been, um, well, what's the impact on, on society going to be? You know, information's moving too fast because of the telegraph. We can't deal with it. Um, the, um, um, the, the railroad is, is, there's a great quote in the book um, uh, from an Indiana um, uh, newspaper editorial about the railroad coming to town saying that, um, that why, why farm boys were, will want to get on the train to go see their girl in Ohio on Sundays and how will we have them back to work? Um, and uh, I'm not trying to make light of the point you make, which is a very valid point, but it is, it is always a challenge of new technology, and the choice is, again, you know, we control this. I, last point, has anybody read Sapiens? Wonderful book, wonderful book. And in Sapiens, he talks about how there are only two animals that man has, has successfully uh, domesticated. One is the horse and the other is the dog. And the difference between those two domestications is the dog is also domesticated man. <laughs> you know, and my dog hops on my bed every night, you know, and I'm going, oh, you're the world's best. And I'm thinking, who has trained whom here, <laughs> right? We're still in control. You asked the right question. We need to keep asking that question and assert sheets for answers and to assert our control. Harold, thank you very much for the privilege of being here.